Good morning, and welcome to day three. Um, today, we have another great keynote. We're going to be doing some long form sessions in the morning. We have a great lunch today from Homegrown Smoker, and we are going to be doing some other exciting things in the evening. Uh, these wonderful open source bridge pint glasses that you've been drinking out of all week, feel free to take one home with you. We will have them out at lunch today for you to acquire pint glasses, um, because we do not want to store all of the pint glasses. Uh, no, we might print more. If you bring them back ne next year, you can have the one blue one. It will be special. Um, this evening, we are holding a party. Um, it is... <laughs> We're holding a party. Uh, it, we're going to have some food, some drinks, some fabulous prizes, some games. Uh, Simple and Guilt, thank you very much for sponsoring this party. Um, <laughs> the party is going to be held at a space called Refuge. It's over on the other side of the river, and we will have maps available over at registration for you to pick up. Um, and you can talk to anybody at registration and they can tell you more about how to get there. Um, it's a pretty easy walk, actually. It probably takes about half an hour, or there are buses, or there are cars, or there are taxis. There's a number of ways to get over there. And it starts at 7, which I didn't put on the slides. Now I'm going to turn it over to Christy. Uh, those of you who are able to stick around, we would love for you to join us for the Friday Unconference, sponsored by the Wikimedia Foundation. Uh, how many have been to an unconference? Like bar camp or something. Awesome. Okay. So a lot of you know what that's about. Scheduling will kick off at 9 a.m. And then uh, sessions will start at 10.15. So if you have something you really want to talk about and share with other people, get here at 9, get your topic up on the board. And also tomorrow, we'll have a wrap-up session at 3.30. It's your opportunity to give conference organizers feedback in real time. And to incentivize you to stick around, we're having uh, O'Reilly gave us a good stack of books, and we're going to be raffling those off. So please stick around for that. Thanks again to our sponsors, Intel, Engineard, Google, RentTrack. We can't put this conference on without you. We also have some uh, other additional awesome sponsors. The other thing that uh, is essential to the conference is our volunteers. So can I get a round of applause for all those folks wearing the green shirts? So after four comes five, and that's the date. Uh, year five of Open Source Bridge will be here in Portland from June 18th to 21st, and it will be at this venue again. We're opening registration, should be open now, actually, or sometime today, and we have super duper ridiculously cheap tickets through the it's next couple of, the, the fourth, couple of days, I think, yeah. next couple of days. So uh, if you think you want to come again, go ahead and buy your super ridiculously cheap ticket. It might actually even be called that, I'm not sure. We have our last keynote speaker today. Paul Fenwick is an internationally acclaimed presenter, director of Pearl Training Australia, author of Pearl's Autodie Pragma, and he can often be found dressed like a pirate. Paul, welcome. Thank you. <laughs> okay, so I can't really do better than that. So uh, you can all go for morning tea early if you want. So. <laughs> How are we doing with the slides up there? They look okay. Excellent. So good morning, everyone. How are we all feeling today? Good? Excellent, excellent. Some of us are very awake, which is a little bit surprising. Yes, yes. Wasn't expecting that. <laughs> so um, my talk, as you know, is called Fear, Uncertainty, and Dopamine. And um, it's a little bit of an, an interesting story to begin with this because some of you might recall that just before Open Source Bridge started, 
just before the conference started, an email went out telling everyone about how wonderful this conference was going to be, and we had these three amazing keynote speakers who would be giving great keynotes on open source citizenship. Now, that was a bit of a surprise to me, because I thought I was talking about brains. So that was the fear and, and uncertainty right there for me. But um, really, this is a talk about brains, but I am going to be talking about open source citizenship as well. And what I want to focus on is looking at how people's brains work and uh, how we can find ways to encourage them <laughs> to become good open source citizens, to join our ranks. Now, I would like to start by talking about fear, because that's the first word in my talk title. But fear... <laughs> I know, it's terrifying, isn't it? But fear is not a, uh, a very good thing for me to talk about without me talking about motivation first. Because we want to motivate people, and we might motivate them using fear. So if you look at how people are motivated, there are two very broad categories that things fit into. There are internal motivations. Internal motivations are things like, I believe in X, or I enjoy doing X, or the most powerful of all, I am this sort of person. And that last one is very, very important. How people perceive themselves directs a lot of their behavior and what they will and will not do. The other type of motivations you can get are external motivations. These include things like money, but they can also things like, be things like fines or penalties or threats. They're externally imposed things which incentivize somebody to do something or not do something. And there are some things which sort of fit in the middle. Status, as far as I'm concerned, fits in the middle of those two. People like to have status, they like to have fame, they like to have recognition. So it's something which drives them internally, but that recognition comes from other people. If all of our commits to open source software were done anonymously, I think we'd see a lot less open source software. Now, as far as I'm concerned, internal motivations are much, much better than external ones. Because with the external ones, when you stop paying those maintenance costs on the person, they stop working. Internal ones, people keep on going. And some of you might have seen a talk by Stormy Peters uh, a few years ago called Would You Do It Again For Free? And she uh, explains in that, and she uh, investigates in that, this idea that you can have somebody with a strong internal motivation for doing something. I enjoy writing open source. And if you give them an external motivation, like you start paying them money, that can actually ablate or override the internal one. So it goes from this enjoyable thing that you're working on to just becoming a job. And in fact, we've heard previously this week the advice to do your things that you enjoy as hobbies, not as a job. Now, I don't actually like that. I would rather people do what they enjoy because they really love it. But more importantly, I want to know, can we do the reverse? If I have somebody who has no internal motivation to do something, but they will respond to external stimuli, can I use those external stimuli to encourage the person to form those internal beliefs? And the answer is hell yes. <laughs> now, I've been studying like a lot of psychology over the last year or two, so you'll see lots of citations through this talk, and uh, they will all go up on the speaker's notes, on the session notes, I should say, um, probably at morning tea. I'm going to sit down and sort of grab everything from my citation manager. So you will find them all there. So the best way that psychologists uh, learn things is through experiments that I'm, I'm always like, curious about how they get past the ethics committee. So the one I'm going to show you was done on children. Um, they're about four years old in this study, and it involves threatening them. So um, what you do is you grab your, your sort of uh, cohort of four-year-olds uh, in your preschool, and you give them a bunch of toys. So, so far, this sounds good. And you'll give them, you know, maybe some blocks to play with. Um, maybe you'll give them some robots. Um, you know, you give them other sorts of things as well. And you ask them to rank those toys. So what you do is you, you let them play with them all, and then you say, OK, out of this toy and this toy, which would you rather play with? And then you say, out of this toy and this toy, which would you rather play with? And you get this ranking of what's their favorite toy and what's their least favorite toy. What you then do is you have the researcher take the second favorite toy, for a reason we'll see in a moment, and they put that on the table. And they say, I need to leave the room for about 10 minutes. And you can play with any of the toys except for this one, except for their second favorite toy. 
And at this point, the experiment splits. For half of the children, they are given a weak threat. They are told if they play with that toy, the researcher would be annoyed. The other half of the children are given a strong threat. I would be angry if you played with this toy. And I would take all of the toys away, and I would never come back. <laughs> and the very, very worst part, I would think that you were a baby. <laughs> so as you can imagine, this is terrifying if you're a four-year-old. This person has given you this very, very strong motivation not to play with this toy. And then the researcher leaves the room, has a stopwatch, it counts down 10 minutes. There's a one-way mirror in the room so you can see what the child is doing, and none of the children in the study played with that forbidden toy. Some of them sort of approached it, and then they had second thoughts. None of them played with it. The researcher then comes back and says, hey, you can now play with all the toys. Now, what's interesting is how the rankings change, because they then ask the child to reevaluate how much they like each toy. In the case of the strong threat, where it's like, I will be very angry and I think that you're a baby, that forbidden toy became more attractive. A lot of the children, most of the children, said, I want to play with this toy that I've been forbidden to play with before. So by explicitly forbidding something, it's become more attractive. But what's fascinating is the weak threat. In the case of the weak threat, that toy became less attractive. Instead of going up to first, it would go down to third or possibly even more. Now, what's, what's going on there? How is a weak threat going to dissuade a child from using this long term? And in fact, if you go back two weeks later and you supply all the toys again, you find that that halts, that the toy is still devalued two weeks later. Well, what's going on here is it's theoreticized that the child has conflicting beliefs. In the strong threat situation, they know why they're not playing with the toy. It's because they don't want to be a baby. But in the weak threat situation, it's like, well, I, I, I'm going to annoy this researcher who I, I don't really know. I don't have a good or strong reason not to be playing with the toy. So they make up their own reasons why they're not playing with the toy. I don't like that toy anymore. I like this other toy better. I've played with that toy enough. This is a state that we call cognitive dissonance. When you find yourself holding two conflicting views at once, or you find yourself believing one thing but doing another thing. And it's not a very pleasant state to be in. Now, in fact, you can tell when someone has been in a state of cognitive dissonance because they often say things like this. I wouldn't have enjoyed it anyway. Whenever you hear somebody say that, that's a very, very clear uh, sign that they have just changed their opinions. They've changed their internal mentality of what they believe. And in fact, there's this whole field of like archaeology on people's thoughts where you can see, oh, you held this belief at this time, but then you overrode it with something else. And you can actually spot these, these cognitive patches that people build up. So let's look at a real-world example where people were deliberately manipulated into having this state of cognitive dissonance. And in fact, this actually happened in the Korean War, back in the 1950s. Now, there were prisoner of war camps that were run by the communist Chinese, and unlike every other prisoner of war camp you've seen, these ones ran essay writing competitions. <laughs> which is not normal for a prisoner of war camp. And in fact, they had this, this large program of having prisoners write things down and discussing things with them. The reason they had the essay writing competitions is because they wanted to change the opinions of the prisoners, to say that maybe communism wasn't too bad or maybe we shouldn't be fighting this war. Now, those competitions had prizes, and it was usually like a piece of fruit or a couple of cigarettes. They were not very big prizes. But they were still attractive enough that the prisoners would write these essays. And what became very clear is that the essays which would win were ones which would say, well, communism probably wouldn't work in America, but it seems to be working okay in China. And this war is really not a good idea. Things which don't you know, jump all the way over to the other side, but make concessions to it. And then, of course, when the person won the essay, they would be asked to, you know, read it out in front of their peers or to broadcast it over radio. And what's happening now is they don't have a strong incentive and they're very publicly committing to something or expressing something and they can be formed or encouraged to believe that. So where does this happen? And it's very, very effective. This was incredibly effective as a way of changing people's opinions. 
So where does this happen in the open source world? Well, one place it happens is in the Perl Foundation. Now, the Perl Foundation has this thing where instead of having essay writing competitions, it has grants. And there's kind of an essay writing competition in there because what you do is you write your own grant proposal. You would say, I would like some money from the Perl Foundation, and this is what I'm going to be working on, and this is how much money I will need. Now, what's fascinating about this is almost every single person who applies for a grant at the Pell Foundation values themselves way, way less than the market rate. These are people who have incredible talents, often very specialized talents, and who are working on bugs or working on things which practically nobody else can work on because they have this specialized knowledge. And what's happening is they're selling themselves way less than they're worth. So they're not ablating their internal reasons with these external money. Instead, the external money means that they're, they're no longer a volunteer. This is now a commitment device. They don't have a way out of this. Once they've got the grant accepted, everybody's looking at them. Everybody's saying, OK, you've got this money now, and that causes fear. You know, if they're going to say, hey, I can't do this, it makes them look bad. Now, that fear is not necessarily fear of their peers saying, I don't like what you're doing here, but it's a fear of inconsistency. And this is a huge motivator. People like to appear consistent. If you get somebody to write down their opinions on something, it becomes much more difficult for you to get them to change those opinions. If you have somebody say, I am going to do this in a very public way, it's very, very hard to stop them from doing that. Because you know, everyone is seeing, and if there's money in there, it gets even more difficult. So this is a great way of binding the souls of these existing contributors to get them to do what they actually want to be doing. But that's great with existing people. How do you get fresh blood? How do we use this to get more people involved in open source? Well, we can do this by looking at some of the studies from the 1960s. And um, again, these involved psychologists doing obnoxious things. And uh, the most obnoxious thing in this study was asking, can we put this sign in your yard? Now, the sign, it's worth noting, is this enormous sign that says, drive safely. And like, they knock on the door, it's like, hi, we're from like, the, the concerned citizens for road safety, and uh, we would like you to put this sign in your yard. And, and here's a picture of what it will look like. And on the picture, the sign obscures most of the house. <laughs> it's this huge sign. And what's more, like the font is awful, and the kerning, the kerning is just slightly off, so it, it looks terrible. And they say, oh, it, it'll leave a hole in your lawn, but you know, that'll, that, you can fill that back in. The grass will grow back after we take it out. And um, of course, this is the 1960s. In the 1960s, they didn't have Comic Sans. And for all of you people who hate Comic Sans, the Comic Sans of the 1960s was even worse. <laughs> so this was the most obnoxious sign you could imagine. And what's amazing here is that about 16.5% of people asked would actually agree to this. So as a baseline level of insanity, 16%, aha, here's the, the source of the quote, about 16% of America is insane at any one time. <laughs> so how can we get people to put this huge obnoxious sign in their yard? Well, what we do is you have somebody a couple of weeks beforehand turn up and say, hi, I'm from, this is a different person who claims to be from a different organization, and says, hi, I've got like this three-inch sticker that I'd like you to put on your car. And of course, almost everyone says, yeah, I'm, I'm happy to do that. It says, be a safe driver. I can stick that on my bumper bar. And then a couple of weeks later, you come back with an entirely different person. And it's important by experimental design that this is another person who has no idea if this person has been contacted before or not. And they say, hey, can you put this obnoxious sign in your, in your yard? And guess how many people say yes? 76%. Holy smokes. <laughs> How does a bumper sticker get you to 76% compliance? What's more, it gets better. It doesn't have to be a bumper sticker. It doesn't even have to be about cars or driving safely. You can have somebody turn up two weeks before with a petition 
that says, hey, can you sign this petition to keep California beautiful? It's this incredibly vague, non-controversial thing that says, yes, California should be beautiful. And everybody signs, there's a whole bunch of signatures on there already. If you do that, you get 48 compliance on the huge, ridiculous sign. What the hell is going on there? What happened? Well, what's happening there is you have a change in self-image. These people who have you know, gone from mostly sane have said, oh, you know, I'm now a community-minded citizen. I care about these community issues, like keeping California beautiful or driving safely. And as a consequence to that, they act in the way that they think a community-minded citizen should. Now, this is called the foot-in-the-door technique. And it gets used all the time in sales. This is something which has been very, very well researched in the sales community. And what's fascinating is how insidious it is. If you have somebody call you up and say, hi, I'm from such and such a research organization, and I'm just doing some research on these things, you know, can I ask you some questions? I'm not trying to sell you anything. And then they ask you, you know, um, are you a generous person? Do you give to charity? How often do you give to charity? It's almost guaranteed that in two weeks' time, you'll have a charity turn up on your doorstep asking for money. Because everybody likes to say, yes, I'm a generous person. Of course I give to charity. And then they think internally, oh, I am a generous person. And when a charity turns up, they get more cash. Now, what does this mean for us in open source? It means those entry-level tasks are hugely important. The equivalent of that three-inch sticker for somebody who is not involved in open source is huge because they go from being a person to an open source contributor or an open source citizen or somebody who uses open source or somebody who is involved in your project. So if you can have somebody file a bug or fix a wiki page, half the projects I've been involved with have, have had me like, you know, fix up a piece of punctuation on a page somewhere. And now I'm like, oh, I really like this project. I should do more work on it. Get them to give a lightning talk, get them to wear a badge because that's public, have a sticker on their laptop, tweet about something because that's an incredibly public thing, write a testimonial. When you have those products which are like, tell us in 50 words or less why Acme Coffee is the best and you can win 10,000 schmuckers, that's not something which is just like, oh, I feel like running a competition. That's getting people to commit to thinking that this coffee is the best brand even if they've never purchased that coffee before. So all of these are ways of getting the foot in the door. What's more, if somebody looks like they are helping you, even if they've patched a bug that has already been patched, or they're submitting like some sort of thing which is already there, whatever it happens to be, if it looks like they are trying to help you, acknowledge them like crazy. It doesn't matter if they haven't actually helped, they're trying to help. So acknowledge what they are doing. This makes them feel good, which is very, very important. And what's more, it binds their fate to yours. Because now everybody knows that this person is involved in your project. And they're more likely to continue on. They feel some level of responsibility there. So that's me talking about fear. And now I want to talk about uncertainty. Now some of you, hopefully a lot of you, went to a talk uh, by Noreen and Schwern the other day called Text, oh, text Communication Lacks Empathy. Now, I'm not going to cover all the things which are in there. Um, the notes online, the session notes for this, are absolutely fabulous. You should definitely look at them. Um, but it covers, in short, this very common thing we have, of mailing list host hostilities, where people on mailing lists get into arguments or anything else where text communication is concerned. And what I want to know is why. Why is text communication making it so easy for us to be angry with each other? And it actually makes sense if you start looking at evolutionary psychology. How do people's minds develop as we evolve? So as we evolved, our biggest threats, most recently, are the humans. There's in fact a decent chunk of evidence out there that the reason we are so smart is because that would allow us to outsmart our biggest threat, other humans. Now what happens if you miss somebody being nice? Well, you're insensitive. That's bad, but it's not terrible. What happens if you miss somebody being hostile, however? You could end up being injured or dead. So consequently, we have this bias, 
we have this natural hostility bias that says that if we have a neutral message and we decode it somehow, we are more likely to decode that as hostile than as neutral or friendly, if, if we decode it incorrectly. The other thing is, we're very, very good at decoding hostile intent. We're very, very good at spotting somebody who is angry or mad or grumpy with us. Amazingly good at that. We're not so good at decoding positive or neutral effect. We make a lot more mistakes there. And in fact, that's even the case with meat space cues. Even when you have uh, body language and vocal tone, you still get these mistakes. And in fact, there are lots and lots of studies out there which are like, I want you to communicate using these neutral words that you're happy with this other person. So you have people using all their body language and all their vocal warmth, people still get it wrong. It's like, oh, that was a bit gruff. And in fact, this is even the case with married couples. In some cases, it's especially the case with married couples. So if this all happens in meat space, you can just imagine how much worse text is where you don't have all these additional cues. And in fact, what will happen is you'll get these snowball effects. Person number one will say something which is completely neutral. There is no hostility there whatsoever. Person number two will incorrectly detect hostility. And person number one, who has an amazing hostility detector, because we all do, goes, oh, you're being hostile now. Suddenly, you end up with a flame war. So you end up with these snowballs happening just because of how people think. What's worse, if you have a poor relationship with someone, you suddenly have this huge hostility bias. You think that they're being sarcastic, you think that they're being snarky, you think that comments are being directed at you. That's not the case, or it's not necessarily the case, but people are very apt to believe that. So one of the big things which came out of Noreen Swan's talk, assume good intent. If the message is unclear, if somebody's not saying, I think you suck, and even then, it might be, I think you suck, smiley face, <laughs> if anything is unclear, assume good intent. The other thing which I want to discuss, which is somewhat related, is outreach. Now, this is something which you'll see a lot, again, in advertising. Advertisers really know how to mess with people's heads. One of the rules that you'll find is that people like things which are familiar to them. People like people who are familiar to them. And advertising knows this. You can tell who a product is aimed at by looking at the people in their advertising. So you can figure out who painkillers are aimed at, arthritis medicine is aimed at, pop culture magazines or pop music magazines, uh, shaving gear. In fact, you'll even see some regional differences. So the Microsoft advertisements in America will be different from the Microsoft advertisements in Poland. And yes, that was real. So, there is a wonderful um, uh, post uh, by a blogger called Greta Christina. And again, all of these links will be in the session notes at the end. And she essentially talks about this idea of homogene ho homogeneity inertia, where you have a homogenous society and it just keeps on going that way. If you don't change your culture, it just keeps on being homogenous. And she tries to explain why. She does so very well. First of all, she explains that people have this unconscious bias that we naturally like people who seem familiar to us. Now, that can be people who look like us, who speak similar to us, who have similar views to us, who use the same editor us, or the same programming language. Whatever it happens to be, we like people who feel similar to us. And in fact, we have this focus on, uh, on problems and on solutions which apply to us and the people who are similar to us. And that's very, very natural. Because if I can spot this problem that applies to me and my peers, well, of course I'm going to see it, because it, it applies to me. I can spot it. I don't have to think about, oh, is this other person going to have an issue? Because I'm not in their head. And even if you don't have those biases, even if you're like completely open and you can relate to everyone and you're trying to cater for everyone, there's this self-fulfilling prophecy that if somebody turns up to your community and says, oh, everybody here is different to me, they assume that those first two biases are in place that there is a reason why no one else in the community is like they are. And they'll be very, very hesitant to join. Now, I actually got struck by this in a, in a very surprising way a few weeks ago at uh, the Pearl Conference at YAPSI. And uh, Jacinta Richardson did some research on what sort of people 
we're doing Pearl Training. So Jacinta and I run Pearl Training together, uh, Pearl Training Australia together. We went to a number of, or she went to a number of training organizations which are at the conference and asked about what sort of people were coming on commercial Pearl courses. She asked questions like, you know, what was their race? What was their gender? But she also asked, what was their operating system? When people were learning Pearl, what were they going to be using as their operating system? Because Pearl runs on just about everything. Now, if you look at the Pearl community, and by that I mean the people who turn up to Pearlmongers and the conferences and whom I argue with on IRC, and I assume good intent when I do that, um, it's around about, I would take a guess, around about 10% Windows. And most people are working on a Unix-flavored system of some sort. And what this means is that if you're using the CPAN, if you're using like the best part of Perl, all these modules that you can download, it's somewhat impoverished if you're working on Windows. There's a whole lot of things which simply don't work on Windows systems or which are a pain to install or have extra bugs. But if you look at the commercial students, if you look at people whose companies are actually paying money to send them on courses to learn Perl, about half of them are using Windows. But those people are not entering the Perl community. And the reason why was very, very clear at Yapsi. When Jacinta mentioned Windows, there was this whole grumble that went throughout the audience. People, oh, Windows, I don't like that. If you happen to be a person using Perl under Windows, it's very hard to enter the Perl community. It feels very hostile. And it's not something which you'll immediately see. So outreach is important. Role models are important because people see people familiar to them. Now, I'm not going to go through all the details of how to do this, but there are two excellent websites out there, geekfeminism.org and the ADR Initiative. So that brings me to the last part of my talk, which is dopamine. And um, dopamine is, is what makes you happy. Dopamine and serotonin, you know, they're, they're good brain chemicals. And I wanted to ask this question of, will X make me happy? You know, I'm thinking of doing this, will it make me happy? And that's a, a pretty tricky question to answer. So I found a different thing which I can answer instead, which is, will I regret it later on? <laughs> Seeing what people regret is absolutely fascinating. And in fact, there are some fantastic studies out there. And the one which I've referenced here actually looks at 720 gifted individuals. So these are the regrets of very, very smart people who are now in their 70s. They've actually been studied over many, many years. So these will probably apply to the people in this room. What's fascinating is how much there is balance between different types of regret. So people who regretted to, that they failed to seize the moment, 27%. People who regretted that they rushed into something too soon, 22%. Missed romantic opportunities and unwise romantic adventures were about the same. However, there are some things where you saw a huge amount of imbalance. Education. Practically everybody said, oh, I, well, everyone who had a regret about education was they didn't have more education, or they goofed off during their degree, or they didn't complete their degree, or they didn't learn something else. Very, very few people regretted learning things. So education was important. Now, of course, you could tell that the people in the regret study had a sense of humor, because some of them regretted participating. <laughs> but the most telling one for me, hobbies. 14% of people, if they were asked, could they live their lives again, what would they do? They said, I would pursue my hobbies more. The number of people who said, I regret pursuing my hobbies, I regret having any hobby whatsoever, be it like stamp collecting or whatever it happens to be, none. 548 different types of regrets were analyzed. None of them involved regretting their hobbies. So if you are thinking, doing something new, joining a project, trying out an idea, learning how to play the organ, please, 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 tweet about it publicly, tell everyone you know that you're doing this, and then go for it, because you will not regret it.
Thank you. <laughs> so do we have time for questions? Cool. Five minutes worth of questions. Any volunteers? If you can phrase your question as a commitment, that would be fantastic. <laughs> OK, no questions. Um, oh, yes. Mm -hmm. Oh, I know it happens because I do it all the time. And, um, and I actually lean heavily on the fact that I can say, oh, I'm going to do this great thing, and then later on I say, oh, look, I'm just a volunteer, I don't have time anymore, things have got very, very busy. Um, but if you keep doing that, then you have to find new communities to give you that reward. Otherwise, they're like, oh, yeah, he says he's doing this project, but you know, he never comes through. Jamie. Oh, what a great idea. The question was, um, do you have situations where somebody says that they're going to do something, which gives them reward, because people go, oh, that's fantastic, and then they discontinue it later on, because they're not continuing, they feel they've already got the reward. And obviously, yes, it works, but you have to keep finding new people if you continue with that behavior. But I, I know that I do that myself. Yes? Microsoft Windows, yes. Yes. No, no, no. I, it's not a case of like 90% of Perl programmers, you know, only use a TTY. Um, <laughs> I was referring to Microsoft Windows when I, I gave those figures. Any other questions? Yes. I would actually refer you to a talk which is happening later today. Uh, when, when, is, when is your talk? Oh, so the question was, um, can you share some experiences on how do you uh, lead someone enough, because uh, they need some hand-holding, but not leading them so much that they don't learn? Was that a, a decent para paraphrase? Yes. Now, I've forgotten how to pronounce your name. Is it Lini? Le Le Lena. Lena is actually doing a talk later today on how to teach people effectively. And, uh, and having stayed up way too late working on slides, I'd actually recommend you go to that, because um, I know I've only got a couple of minutes. When is your talk? 1.30. Excellent. Um, am I out of time? Four minutes. Oh, wow. That was a very, very slow minute. <laughs> yes, up the back. Daniel. OK, so I have a whole bunch. So, how do you get your foot in the door with people? I have a whole bunch of really sort of dumb person tricks. So um, one thing which I'll do is I'll wander around, especially Portland, with a hat. And, and people will say, oh, it's Portland, it's wonderful. So people will cross the street to compliment me on my hat. <laughs> and, and this is interesting, because like, if I'm in you know, New York, uh, people cross the street to avoid me. <laughs> but, but in Portland, people will cross the street to compliment me on my hat. And they'll go, nice hat. And I'm like, oh, thanks, mate. And they're like, are you from Australia? I'm like, fair dinkum I am, mate. And, <laughs> and for some reason, Australians are especially loved over here. And that works really, really well. Um, if you're not Australian and you don't have a hat, um, <laughs> then I, I actually recommend the very best thing you can do, and I can provide uh, papers to back this up, is you show approval for what the other person is doing. So whatever that other person is doing, you say, oh, I love your talk, um, or I, you know, I, I like your hair, or I like your code, or I like the, you know, whatever other thing you've done, I like your, your taste in coffee. You show approval for them, and that usually gives you a large amount of liking. Suddenly, like, oh, this person approves of me, you can then sort of, you know, work onwards from there. So that's one thing which works very, very well is showing approval. Does that answer your question? Sure, okay. <laughs> I now have all these people like in the room thinking, hang on a second, Paul said he liked this about me. <laughs> Is he just trying to get his foot in the door? Yes. Um, so the question was, how do you do that while still remaining genuine, or still feeling genuine? 
Um, I have this condition where I absolutely love humanity. And so it's really, really easy for me to get enthusiastic about stuff. And if there's not something I can find to be enthusiastic about something, like with a person, chances are I'm not trying to get my foot in the door there. Um, but usually people have something which I like about them. You know, I love your glasses. They look fantastic. Um, and anyway, sorry, I'm, I'm looking at glasses now. Um, <laughs> how do you do it while remaining genuine? I, I, I would love to answer that. Um, I actually go, you keep on looking until you find something nice about them. And if not, then why have I got that objective? Why am I trying to get my foot in the door? Yes? Um, so the question was, how do I go about developing my talks? Um, fear is a huge amount. <laughs> and, and, and I kid you not there. Like, what will happen is I'll say, oh, yes, I'll do this talk. And then suddenly it's like, oh, my goodness, I'm giving a keynote. And, and fear is this enormous motivator. Um, I naturally do a lot of reading. I've, I've got a citation manager called Zotero, uh, which is free. It's open source, it's cross-platform. Um, I'll put it up in the session notes, uh, Zotero, Z-O-T-E-R-O. And uh, it's great for being able to index things, find things quickly, so on and so forth. Um, the other thing which I do is I have a, uh, a mind map, um, which allows me to, to sort of jot things down. Um, and there's also, uh, actually uh, now local to Portland, um, there is a website called Beeminder. And Beeminder allows you to, to set up commitment devices where you can say, I'm going to write one slide per day, and if I don't write one slide per day, then I'm going to forfeit like $30. You can actually put up an amount of money which you'll forfeit if you don't do what you say you're going to do. And uh, that leads into that whole fear thing of I'm afraid of losing that $30, I'll write my one slide per day. And uh, that works pretty well for me. I use it for like uh, flossing my teeth and uh, using my Anki cards and like invoicing clients and all these other sorts of things. Answers your question? Cool. Now I think we are out of time now. Cool. Everyone, thank you very, very much.